probably a month and a half ago, we had a conversation about um, sort of your cultural self-awareness and understanding your own story, understanding, uh, you know, starting to open your eyes to things around you that are different, different types of people, different types of situations, um, religions, race, I did, um, sexuality, gender, gender identity, um, ability. We talked about all that kind of stuff and how do you sort of tend to react in those situations when you're around people who are different from you. We talked a little bit about um, how do you respond if somebody says something that you feel is inappropriate or prejudiced or bigoted or racist or that kind of thing. Um, today what we're going to do is sort of take the next step along that journey and talk about um, what are, how are, what are some, some more of your sort of um, understandings about stereotypes and how are those constructed and how do you start to deconstruct those and how do you start to uh, engage with people in a way that is uh, effective, in a way that is sensitive, uh, but without just totally avoiding people who are different from you or avoiding situations that you're uncomfortable with because you don't want to say the wrong thing or you don't want to seem like you don't fit in that kind of thing. So it's like, how do we find that balance between uh, being really disrespectful and inappropriate and avoiding the situation completely? There's sort of that, you know, and there's no one right answer of how to do that, but we're going to explore that a little bit today. Um, and then we've got some folks who are going to talk toward the end of the class um, and share some of their experiences on campus. So I'm going to start out with a video. How many of you have seen the show, What Would You Do? Anyone seen that? Somehow I missed this, and it's, it's a little bit old, judging by the way people are dressed. Um, but I'm going to show you a, a segment from this, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. You see this and you wonder, did he lose his keys or is he blatantly stealing that bike? In broad daylight, he hammers and then saws on the chain. When that doesn't work, he pulls out an industrial sized bolt cutter. And when he's asked, he messes up. You lost the lock? Uh, no, not exactly. But he's not a real thief. Justin Kelly is an actor, and our hidden cameras are rolling. What happened? Uh, not that I just, I can't get through the lock. I mean, I know this is weird, but you wouldn't have to know whose bike this is. Alright, good, thank you. While the scene troubles Tim Lucas enough to turn around for a second look, he's in a family out. His wife looks alarmed too, but they both move on. Colleen, my wife, she's like, he's totally stealing that bike. She was like, call the cops. It turns out Lucas is a pastor, but our thief's confession is safe with him. It was odd that somebody had all that, all that equipment. But you didn't do anything. No. That's true. That's the bottom line. Lots of people stop and stare. A few even question the actor. Best thing you have to ask, is that your bike? I guess technically no. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 When no one tries to stop our thief, he ratchets it up a notch with an electric saw, even putting on a pair of goggles. That finally catches the attention of Arlene Menard and her husband George. Well, that's it. Uh, not a lot. It's not your bike, is it? I just want to know if it's your bike. It's, no, it's not my bike. It's not yours. As Arlene sets off to find help, we decide to clue the couple in on our experiment. I think most people don't want to get involved in a situation like this, and so they just pass it by. George is right. In over an hour, about a hundred people pass by. Only George and Arlene try to stop it. Some tell us they plan to call the police later. Others say they're scared. Keep moving. This woman and her friends give our thief the benefit of the doubt. When we ask why, Lisa Washington tells us first impressions matter. I remember thinking, young white men don't usually carry burglary tools. So we all make assumptions, right? Yeah. So I'm thinking maybe he works for the park, and our thoughts were if he'd been black or a person of color, the police would have been called in immediately. We're going to do that experiment with an African American kid. What do you think is going to happen? I like that people will be very distressed. I think someone's going to whip out their cell phone and call the bar the police. Will then, we replace our white thief with this young man, Matlock. Remember, both actors dress in a similar way and are about the same age. Is that your bike? 
Within seconds, another person confronts our thief. Is that your bike? Technically, it's not, but it's gonna be mine. More people can run. Is that on the south? You pull the police and pass the information. Are you picking up by that your bike? Uh, no, it's not, sir. Oh, why are you doing that? Is this, I mean, is this any of our bikes? Is this your bike? No, the bike is it is. So who? Well, but not to you. And sure enough, one man whips out a cell phone to call 911. A raptor triggers more reaction. Some people are even snapping pictures for evidence. <laughs> Once everyone moves away, we reset our camera. And within minutes, another outraged man is yelling. Are you still trying to steal my bike? Excuse me, sir, but the bike's been here for, for, for days. Like, no one's going to take it. Well, that's like your bike, then. Yeah. You can't just come in and take something from somebody. Excuse me, sir. I'm like, okay, I'll just take this over later. <laughs> <laughs> Please, sir, don't touch my stuff, sir. Please, sir, do not touch my oh, stuff. Wait, 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 yeah, I, yeah, all right, but this, is, but this has been here. Like, who's going to take it? That doesn't make it your property. Technically, it does. No, it doesn't technically. <laughs> it's not yours. All right, so when we bring out our cameras, David Robb wants us to go after the thief. That kid in the red shirt is hacking away at my head. And he has the right to take it and steal it. And he's come here with tools, obviously. You know, sir, uh, my name is John Quinone, so this is part of a TV show called What Would You Do? You were pretty upset. I'm not. Right. It's important that we speak up in these situations. I think so. <laughs> it's to say like the right thing to do. <laughs> Everyone insists that justice is colorblind. Did the race of the culprit have anything to do with it? Not at all. I mean, he could have been any color. It, it wouldn't have mattered to me. I think it was taking a bike that wasn't his, not what his color was. Maybe, but take another look at how people pass right by the white actor, and the police department, but not the black actor. Madlock sits nearby, stunned by what just happened. These racial stereotypes are infused in all of us. I mean, it's part of our culture. So whether you're black or white, you associate crime with blacks and you associate whites with being good. Jack DeVidio, psychology professor at Yale University. Whether we believe it, whether we notice it, whether we acknowledge it, race is affecting what I see, what I think, what I do. The video says we all see these openings to reassure ourselves that we're not biased. Lost your key? Yeah, actually, I didn't need my key. So when given an opening like this lost key explanation, people may respond kindly, challenging the actor who might come off as racist. So I get the bag to get the phone. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I want you to turn to somebody and talk for a minute about uh, what did you think of that? Was that surprising, what they saw? Um, and how much do you think that race really had to do with that? Okay, so have a little conversation with somebody next week.
so what do you what do y'all think about this? Um, I want to hear from a couple of you. How many people were surprised at those reactions? Raise your hand if you were you were like, wow, I can't believe that. People are so cruel. And how many people were like, yep, that totally makes sense. Okay? So that's a good a good level of awareness. Let, let's hear from a couple people. So what were you what, what were your thoughts about it? And again, remember I'm gonna call on folks, so you might as well be bold and friendly and put yourself out there. What do you think about that? What's your reaction to it? Yeah, go ahead. I was surprised that the first people to jump to the conclusion that the black kid was stealing the bike was the old black woman. Okay. Gotcha. So you were surprised that they didn't think the white guy was stealing the bike? No, no. I was surprised that the first people to like notice the black kid and think, oh, he's stealing the bike was a black lady. Okay, so the way that she talked about her own stereotype about, yeah, you'd expect to see a, like a young black kid doing that, but not a young white kid that good. Yeah. Okay, how many folks agree with that? You're like, wow. Oppressing your own people kind of thing. Okay, a few of you. What were some other reactions? Some other things that stood out? Yeah? Although it was obvious that the black kid had more attention to the black kid, he was also more polite. Okay, how many people? The black kid was like, yeah, yeah, I'm stealing it, it's mine. It's going to be mine, it's not mine, it's not mine. It's not mine. Did other folks think that he was a little bit more gregarious or a little more blatant? And how many folks thought the sort of energy level or that sort of flippant attitude was about the same with the two? Okay, so a little bit of each. All right, so that may have been. Um, what are some other thoughts you have? Let's get one more. Go ahead. Um, the, like first people that like asked the colored kid if they stood in it, they kind of drew attention, so then more people came. As with like the first one, like single people were kind of going by. It was not like a big group. So I feel like people are more comfortable like talking to someone once it's a big group. Like they, they're not singled out. Okay, so there was there they tended to like group up around the the, the kid of color. I'm going to clarify, I'll, excuse me if I clarify terminology while we're talking. Generally, like, we refer to people as a person of color, not a colored person. That's just sort of, it's kind of the, the lexicon of the day. Um, but yeah, so that it was like they, people felt comfortable once there were more people around. And did it also seem to you like they tended to congregate more when it was the, the black kid? Yeah, I feel, like, well, I feel like that first people that went up to him were probably more bold than like other people that walked sure. by the first situation. And so once people saw that there was like a group they felt like they could talk to because they weren't like by themselves. Okay, gotcha. Awesome. Um, when the <coughs> white guy was saying, no, it's not really my bike, no, it's not my bike, people would be like, good luck, or yay, yep. you know, like have a good time with that. And then once the black kids said it, it was, that's not okay, that's not right, what are you doing? Sure. It was like, okay, you wish the other guy had luck and he would never can steal a bicycle. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like the kind of the attitude about what he was doing, not just that they did they or did they not stop, but when they found out he was stealing it, they actually were like, okay, cool, enjoy that, have a good day, kind of thing. All right. Do you think it could have been the uh, black kid or the person of color size? Like, it's, he, was, he looked like a small kid, you know, like he was more innocent than the other kids. You know what I'm saying? Like, the other kid, you know, seemed more incredible as a bigger person. Okay, what are, what are other folks? Like, yeah, he maybe. seemed like a small kid, you know, he had his hat sideways, he kind of had that gangster kind of look. To him, okay. Rather than the white kid, had a more of a professional kind of. I mean, how was professional, but. Right. You know, how was the white kid's hat? Anyone notice? It was very cocked to the side. Also cocked to the side kind of thing? Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, so what, what do you think, what do other folks think about the size or the way they were dressed or anything like that? Anyone else feel like. Okay, go ahead. Like it's black, or the person of color. If he was dressed like nicely, I feel like nobody would have said anything. It's the way he dressed too. Okay. But what do you think if the so what about the way the white kid dressed? Did that matter? <coughs> Probably not. Okay. So maybe maybe if the if the black kid it's, so it's okay to say black and white and that kind of stuff. We I was just flipping around the colored person as a, instead of person of color. It's just that was what I was trying to get at. So um, I don't want to confuse it too much, but so the way that so maybe the white kid it doesn't matter how he dressed. But maybe the, the black kid, he has to try extra hard to make sure he doesn't look shady or like he's gangster or that kind of thing. Okay? Um, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, go ahead. I was kind of thinking if they, were, if they did one with the females. Yep. I'm thinking people would see the, the white girl trying to like cut through this thing. They'd probably think it's weird that she has all those tools, but I better help her. Well, and actually, if anyone's seen the rest of this um, episode of that, the next person that they had was a... A blonde, a, like a young blonde-haired white woman. Um, she had kind of a low-cut tank top and short shorts. 
And there were several men who came up and offered to help. Oh, can I, you know, and she was like, it wasn't like, help me get my bike off of here. It was, yeah, I'm stealing this thing. Can you help me with this, with this saw here? <laughs> and there was one guy even that rode up. He was riding with his wife on the bike, and he, like, pulled over, and he's like, hey, I did some time. I can probably help you steal it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a really, that's a really good point. Um, and I was going to show that one, but I didn't want to kind of water down the issue too much, so. Um, <laughs> So any, any other thoughts on that video? Any other, anything that we missed on there? So it seems like folks agree to, to a certain extent that race definitely had a part to play in it. And I think that, and I appreciate some of you for, for being honest about, well maybe it was just because of the way he was dressed or his age or his size or that perception, but, um, but those are the kind of games that we play with ourselves. Because we, you know, like at the end what the guy said was, people don't want to appear racist, so they asked the kid, hey, is that your bike? He said, yes. And then there was like, oh, I don't want to seem like I'm racist, so I'm going to help this kid take this bike off of him, even though, you know, whatever. So maybe that's kind human nature, maybe that's whatever. But we play these games with ourselves, taking our perceptions of what we think is going on in the world and what we see, and then try to play back what's the right thing to do, or how should I be thinking about this, or whatever. But what I'm going to challenge all of you to do today is to be willing to stretch those perceptions. Because a lot of times, I think that we, as, as people, tend to get stuck in our ways of thinking about these things. And so rather than trying to expand or adapt and understand something in a new way, we're okay with just sticking with those stereotypes and those um, sort of narrow understandings that we, that we hold. So um, we're going to talk through a couple slides real quick on the PowerPoint, <coughs> which Blair hates PowerPoint, but this is some old thing that I've had for years. And, um, okay, so when we talk about myths and stereotypes, um, I like to, to break this down a little bit. A myth is the underlying story that is believed about a group of people. So a widely accepted belief about a group of people. So we could say that um, black people steal stuff, or gay people are flamboyant, or, you know, we, we all have heard these things. So we've got a lot of these things that play in our head. Um, and then a stereotype is when we actively take that myth and we apply it to an individual person. Does that make sense? So I want to want to delineate a little bit between the myth, which is that underlying story, and we talked a little bit about last time. Where do those where do those underlying beliefs of those stories come from? Experience. Ex experience, some of them perhaps. Where where are some other places where those come from? TV. TV so the media. Where else? Passed on by our parents, parents our families. Um, and I would challenge you um, when you say from experience. That's more of the stereotype. That's more. That's when we take that thing that we believe and then we apply it to that situation. So that sort of N of one, you know, in, the, in research we talk about, you know, an N is like your study group. So that study group of one. So I've heard my whole life that, um, you know, black people steal stuff. And I saw a black guy steal something, so therefore my experience shows that that myth is true. Is that, do you see what I'm saying? So again, we've got to be careful that we're not using these isolated experiences to validate these myths that we believe. Okay. If they're not isolated experiences, yeah. um, then you know you got to do with that what you're going to. But the, the way that the media portrays it, it portrays a widely disproportionate number of people of color committing crimes. It, it uh, shows a you know widely disproportionate number of um, you know young kids getting into trouble for petty theft and all these kinds of things. So again, you've got to look at: Am I just seeing these things because I've seen it over and over on the media, and I've heard that this is what I should look out for? And maybe you're looking right past, you know, five or ten white kids that are stealing stuff right under their noses, kind of thing. So, um, you know, there could be some truth to it. Um, and there's again, I don't want to just focus on like this one stereotype or this one myth, but. Um, you know, I would challenge you to try to, that's what we're doing today, is trying to broaden the scope and to see where these things that we're applying to one group of people, maybe, you know, they're happening over here with this other group of people. Or maybe these things that we're applying to one group of people aren't actually really happening all that often. Does that make sense? So, um, that, you know, that could be true. So, all right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is, uh, just real quickly, does anyone know what a paradigm is? Does any, any like, psych majors want to talk about paradigm before the slide pops up? Anyone want to read it? So a paradigm is basically the rules and boundaries that construct our understanding of the world. 
So um, the world is sort of this crazy barrage of stimuli. We see lots of stuff going on, we hear things, we meet lots of people, and so this is how we organize our understanding of the world. So that we, um, you know, it's sort of a human nature. It's that fight or flight thing. You know, things that are familiar to me are safe. Things that are not familiar to me are dangerous. Um, and we, as human beings, have to make decisions along the way about what we're gonna do with that information. And so when we have this way of like organizing um, our way of thinking, a paradigm is sort of what keeps us sane and keeps us safe amidst this whole kind of chaotic barrage of things. And so what I'm gonna, we're not going to talk so much about positive and negative aspects of it, but what I want you to think about is, um, okay, we're going to this one. Here. So how do we talk about shifting our paradigms? How do we talk about exploring beyond what we already know? How many people have seen this before? Okay, so most of you, we got to update this thing, but how many folks see the, the old woman in the picture? And how many of you also see the young woman in the picture? How many people just see the young woman? And how many people just see the, the old woman again? Okay, so if we're talking about this picture, and I'm trying to get you to see both the old and the young woman, um, if I say, she's right there, the old woman's right there, I can't believe you don't see it. And you're like, no, I just see the young woman. What, what are you, stupid? You don't see this thing? You know, and I, I try to cram this thing down your throat, you're not gonna be very open to it. But if I come up and I say, well, you see, the old woman, she's got the mouth down there, and the white part going up is her shawl, and she's got the, the feather coming off her forehead, and she's got the black hair and a big nose. And I try to actually explain to you and take you along that journey and, and help you to understand it. You're a lot more likely to to want to be open to this, okay? Does that make sense? So folks that are chattering, am I missing something, or you got some feedback? Okay, cool. Um, I'm always open to it, so raise your hand if you got something that you'd like to share. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about real briefly, and then we're going to move to the next part of this, is the path of intercultural learning. And I like this model because it's a very concrete way of thinking about how do you understand difference and how do you expand your own paradigm. So what this is about is about trying to expand your lens of the world uh, that you live in and understand things and situations and people in a different way. So we start with this place of ethnocentricity. So this is when we rely on our own and only our own ways of being. So it's like I grew up in a small town. Everybody I knew was white, Christian, heterosexual. Um, you know, most people worked on the farm, whatever, that kind of thing. Um, so we have these, and I'm not trying to pick on rural folks, but it could be the same with somebody growing up in an urban area. Um, you know, everybody that lived in my apartment building looked like me. We all had similar stories and that kind of thing. But we understand the world in a very sort of concrete way. Um, and it's, and it's very limited in scope. So we move to a point of awareness when, when we start to understand that there are things that fall outside of our own ethnocentric view. So we recognize, hey, there's difference out there. I don't know what it is, I don't care about it, but there are other things out there. So um, an example that I like to use is when I, I grew up in lower Michigan, um, in a college town, whatever, uh, and when I moved out to college in Arizona, I was driving through Utah, and it said, welcome to the Navajo Indian Reservation. And I was like, what? And it was the first time I had ever actually seen or been aware of the fact that there were, um, in, you know, sovereign indigenous nations living on, uh, living on, you know, what is U.S. soil or whatever we want to call it. Um, so it was like the, you know, okay, all of a sudden I was aware there was something out there. So the understanding, we start to understand that not only are there things out there, but we sort of understand the reason for their existence. So, okay, it was like, well, all right, these folks have their land and they're continuing to live in some of their, um, you know, under similar government structures or in more traditional ways and whatever. So I see that it's out there, I understand there's a reason for its existence, but I don't necessarily get what it's all about or care all that much. Um, we move to a place of acceptance and respect. So this is when we start to allow those things to just be as they are. So it's like, hey, the, the reservation's out there, folks live there, that's cool. Not that they need me to validate their existence, but it's like I start to be okay with the fact that there are different things out there um, and different ways of being that don't always fit into my own paradigm or my own ethnocentric view. So again, this is about expanding your paradigm, expanding your lens, your way of seeing things in the world. So we get to a place of appreciation and valuing. So this is where we begin to see that there are things that, the worth of the things that fall outside of our own paradigm. So I, not only do I see that it exists and I'm cool with that, but it's like, hey, I understand maybe why that is the way that it is. And I see the value in that. And I start to actually show a little more empathy, a little more respect, a little bit more, um, you know, kind of active understanding of what's going on. And then we get to selective adoption, which is where we actually start to take some things from other cultures and infuse them into the way that we live our own lives. 
ones. So um, a good example I like to use is cooking. So all of a sudden, like I'm cooking, I'm, I grew up, you know, European American, 100% Jewish. You know, we grew up like eating overcooked meat and matzo ball soup. Um, but when I was growing up, like my parents took a cooking class at the local um, community college, and they learned how to cook Chinese food. And so we started to, you know, cook, have Chinese meals once a week, and then. You know, you make spaghetti or some Italian thing. And so we start to bring certain parts of other cultures into our own lives. And I don't want to minimize it. It's not just about food, but that's an easy one for people to kind of understand. And then we get to a place of multi multiculturation. And this is the kumbaya where everybody is like happy and equal and dancing around the campfire. Um, but basically what this is is that our lives become kind of a rich amalgamation. Everyone know amalgamation? That's like one of those SAT words. Um, a combination of things that are built from different ways of being, different paradigms, different experiences, di different people's life stories and cultures. Um, so what's important to, to know about this or to understand is that it's not always, it's not like a race to the finish. Like, hey, I'm at that place of multiculturation, I'm done learning, I'm done growing. Or hey, I got to appreciation and valuing, like cool, I'm ahead of the next guy. Uh, but this is a constant journey, a constant expansion of your of your paradigm and your worldview and your understanding. And so what we're trying to encourage you to do is to be willing to um, you know, chip away at that throughout your college experience, throughout your lives. And college is a really great place to start learning about people and experiences and stories that are different from your own because um, there's people from different areas, geographically, people who are different religions and races and genders and sexuality and all these different differences. Um, and so this is the opportunity to start doing some of that stuff. So, um, what I want you to do as we transition into this next part is just take a minute and talk to somebody next to you. Oh, the other part is that you can, you're not always at the same place on this with all types of different issues. So, um, you know, you might be just in the awareness phase of, okay, so there are um, Indian reservations out there. But maybe you grew up with somebody in your family who was gay, and so you're all the way over here into that multiculturation piece when it comes to um, sexual orientation. Does that make sense? So you're not always the, just as knowledgeable about issues of race as you are about issues of ability, those kinds of things. So take just a quick minute, and I want you to, to talk about one place where you feel like you're just sort of starting to understand or starting to raise your awareness of a different religion, of a different culture, a different race, that kind of thing, and one area where you feel like you've already done some work and you already kind of did it, okay? So talk to your neighbor, um, and just share, you're not going to have to share this back, but I'm asking you to engage with one other person and talk a little bit about that. So one place where you're kind of here, one place where you're kind of there. Cool? Um, I've asked a couple folks to come and chat with you today. Um, I'll introduce them in a second, but 
Um, a couple of students who work in our programs in SIT, and um, I've gotten to know on a personal level, and I think they're super awesome. And I, I want to give them the opportunity to talk about their perceptions of how um, differences, cultural differences, play in on this campus. So how do they perceive cultural difference on this campus? And how, what is their sort of advice to all of you as you're starting to move along in this path of intercultural learning? How can you do that in a respectful way? And how can you do that without just totally avoiding it? Okay, like we talked about at the start. It's that sweet spot in between saying a bunch of really ignorant, racist, disrespectful, cruel, bigoted stuff and totally avoiding it. And there's a lot of room in the middle to move around. So that's sort of what we're targeting today. So is that good? Is that cool? Okay, so I'm going to introduce Blair and Kyle. Uh, Blair and Kyle are two awesome individuals who I respect greatly, and I'm going to just sort of let them talk, and then we'll have a chance um, to ask a couple questions toward the end. Cool? All right, hello. My name's Blair. I'm Kyle. Um, we're here to talk to you about maybe some experiences, some advice, I don't know, learning, education, that sort of stuff. We're not the masters of everything. We don't know everything. Uh, we don't expect you to know everything. I do know some of you, however, because I TA for um, a course, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, so we're here to talk to you about, I guess, um, some things that we all could do uh, to, I guess, make our experiences better and experiences um, with, with other people better. Um, you know, and I, 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 we don't want to share all our experiences. I'm sure we could talk for days, but what we have, I mean, 15, 20 minutes to uh, speak to you about some of the stuff that goes on on campus. And I think um, one thing I want to say is this is a really great tool, like Danny said, and you, and you can sort of place yourself on the chart because it is important to understand um, people with different backgrounds or different identities. Um, did you want to say anything? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I guess, you know, on a daily level, I think for me, one of the most important things when talking about these different issues it's, it's not necessarily the big stuff that's out there, whether it's the issues with the election um, and all, this, and all this, this other stuff. I know we're all busy, we all got jobs, well, we don't all got jobs, we don't got jobs, but we all got school, um, some of us have jobs, some of us have student groups uh, that we're involved in, family, friends, all, this, all these different extracurricular sports and that kind of stuff. And I think it's important to stress that we need to work on this sort of stuff in our daily lives. Um, and I think one way to do that is to be able to think about some of the daily processes we go through and being able to break that down into how different people from different backgrounds may react to those situations, right? Um, and how different people with different identities might feel in certain situations. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, I think that kind of, yeah, kind of makes sense. So for instance, in the video, right? Um, you saw a, uh, two different experiences with one young white man, one young black man, um, and we saw what played out. But in reality, we don't get to see how that plays out, right? I mean, luckily there was a camera crew to film the reactions and show us the result of, you know, two different people performing the same tasks um, with different uh, <coughs> racial identities, right? Um, and so we were fortunate enough to be able to observe that. In the real world, that's not how it works. So for example, today, I was standing at the bus stop, right? Right where the sign is. And there's a couple women, young women, standing about 15 yards away from the bus stop, right? Um, and I always stand right next to the bus stop because sometimes bus drivers pass me by. And so I'm standing next to the bus stop, and the bus driver, you know, pulls about 15 yards past me and opens the door to those young women. Now, it's not an issue, but here's, here's where, I, where I, I wanted to point back to the video. Is in the video, we get to see that reality, where in our daily lives, if we're not part of the dominant identity, and we all have some sort of dominant or subordinate identity, we don't know what's really at play. And I think that's important to think about. So do I know that this bus driver pulled past me? because of what I look like? No, I don't know that. And so I'm not going to get on the bus and say anything because it's just conjecture. You know, it's just how I feel. But at the same time, we must recognize that, how does that make me feel? Or when I go into the school store, 
you know, just the other day I was buying some headphones because I had lost mine in the library and I needed some, some headphones to listen to my music. As I grab the headphones and I'm already at the register, I'm putting my thing on the register, one of the employees comes up to me and, you know, just stands next to me and says, can I help you, sir? And it was one of those things where it's like, again, not to say it's because of what I look like, but how do you think that makes me feel when I'm already in the process of paying for my item? And there's another employee engaging me, and we're engaged in that transaction, whereas this employee approaches me and asks me if they can help me. You know, it's sort of intimidating. And, and it, again, it's one of those things where I don't know what was going on. And I, I, you know, one thing I do want to point out as a social psych student, and if, if, are any of you psych students, psychology? Cool. One thing you'll learn through lots of research and lots of papers is that most of our processes are subconscious and unconscious. Most of what we do is not conscious, which we would all hope that that is not the case, but it is. And so I don't know what this person was doing if they actually had a conscious thought to approach me because of what I look like, or with some subconscious thing that they decided to approach me because they thought something was wrong. Either way, it's just one of those daily little things that happens and it leads up to microaggressions. Do you have any examples of that that you want to? Yeah, sure, sure. Microaggressions or little experiences like that. that um, I guess my experiences are a little different. I have what would probably be considered an invisible minority on several levels. So when you look at me, you're probably like, why is there a white kid standing up in front of this classroom talking about being different? Um, and so as someone who does not identify as heterosexual and as someone who does not identify as cisgender, I have a little bit of a different experience than Blair probably. I just threw out some terms you guys probably might not know. Um, do you guys know what heterosexual and homosexual is? Sort of, yes? Yes? Okay. I'll keep asking until you look like you know that you're paying attention. Um, now, have you guys ever heard of someone who's transgender? Yes? So you guys know what that means? Okay. I'm someone who identifies as transgender, so now you can all say you've met someone wonderful, you're probably now to the next little circle bubble on the thing. Um, <laughs> So I walk through my day and people offend me and usually they don't know it. Um, similar to how Blair has experiences, I think, where you think people say things to you or do things to you that they're not really sure why they did it or why they feel that way. Um, people do and say things to me that they're not even sure that they've done that correctly or that they've offended me or that I'm uncomfortable. Um, and so uh, I go through my life sort of <clears throat> trying to figure out the most comfortable space for me as well as navigating for other people because this isn't something that um, I kind of grew up with all my life or something that I can go home to people who are just like me. There's not, there's nowhere to go back to. It's just kind of me. Um, so I think that there's definitely a lot of microaggressions that play out in that. Um, I don't go in locker rooms or bathrooms for probably pretty obvious reasons for most of you. Um, there, there are scary places where microaggression turns to major aggression, if you will, pretty, pretty quickly. So I guess that's sort of where my, that part of my life revolves around. <coughs> No, no, that, that okay. makes sense. That's cool. And I think, you know, like I said before, we all belong to some sort of dominant group, whether, you know, we're white or we're able bodied or we're Christian or whatever. I mean, my, I myself am a male. Um, I was born in this country. Um, I am able bodied. Um, English is my first language. And so I have a lot of privileges over many people. Um, and I think it's important to recognize, you know, what sort of privileges we do have. Um, and be able to break those things down. I mean, how many of you use the stairs on a daily basis? I do. You know, I think most of us use the stairs at least once or twice a day. I see some people use the elevator to go up two floors that I know are able-bodied, like, you know, they were just pumping iron in the gym, and then they go take the elevator. I'm like, come on. But anyway, I think it's, it's one of those things we have to think about. I mean, if you have two classes in a row, how, many, how much time do you have to get to the next class? Ten minutes, right? Well, if you can't or if you're not able to use the stairs, you have to think about a new route to take. And that's going to take you some time. You know, and that's, I mean, those are the types of things we want you to think about. So I guess, I mean, I don't want to talk forever, but I'll open it up and do any of you have any questions or do you want to share an experience or whatever, comments, concerns? And I really urge you guys to ask questions even if you feel like you don't have the language. Um, intention often is the best sort of the best thing to preface things with, like, hey, I don't know how to say this, but I'm, I'm curious, or I, I want to know how to better this or something. Um, 
So especially in, in an educational environment, now would be the time when you can't corner people in the hallway and ask them questions. So you could, but it could be uncomfortable for you and them. So what are some ways people are like offended you without knowing being transgender? Um, well, I mean, it's pretty much an everyday thing. People will see me and they'll automatically assume my gender. They'll automatically assume um, who my partner might be, they'll automatically assume things like that. And it's those statements that really can elevate to being hurtful because I, it's just me, I gotta stand up for myself. And then that's when things can often get very combative because it's not a topic that a lot of people know a lot about. And so um, it's easy for me to make someone else uncomfortable when I'm trying to just be like, uh, hey, that kind of made me uncomfortable. And then they're like, that's not what I meant. Or they kind of like, you know, like, I don't even know what that means or things like that. Um, it just very quickly escalates very fast. And then it's different than I feel like we all kind of are in our generation able to have some conversations about race, that race exists in some aspect. You know, and, it, and a lot of people don't think that who I am exists in some aspect. They just think I'm confused or that I'm, I don't know, or like being rebellious or I'm going through a phase. Um, and so it's those kinds of conversations that then quickly lead to political conversations or religious conversations, which are obviously the hot button topics of our, of our generation, especially around the election. <laughs> so I guess uh, a lot of times people will automatically see my gender. And, then, and that's something that everybody does every single day. I can probably guarantee you that every single one of you will look at someone else you don't know and say, OK, that person looks like a woman. I will use she and her. And then when someone does that to me, they're going to say, OK, this person might be confusing to me, but I'll just pick one. I'll just pick one that seems the most likely, I guess. I, I, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure of the, you know, the thought processes behind that, but that's where it, it gets uncomfortable. So, what would you like, like to be called? I don't know. Like, I prefer male pronouns, but if you're ever unsure, or if you're ever just meeting someone, non-gendered language always the best way to go. Um, using they and them for a person. Although it is grammatically incorrect, and I'm a lit major, and I get really uncomfortable with that kind of stuff. If it can make someone else more uncomfortable, like I'll do it. I'll do it all day long. Calling someone by their name, referring to them as a person, like that person in the green shirt, instead of that woman in the green shirt, or that 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 whatever, and you know, just using um, I say folks instead of guys, things like that, um, to make everyone feel like they don't have to feel like their their like stomach's going to pop their butt when I'm talking to them. Answer your question. Any other questions? Well, I, I will say, I think it's also important to humble ourselves and allow ourselves to be corrected when we do make errors. Because um, a lot of times we may get defensive when we make a mistake. And you have to realize that, um, you know, if you're part of, uh, if you have an identity that is not part of the norm, um, you know, these people get, get, um, you know, mispronounced or targeted or whatever on a daily basis. It's a daily thing. And so you may ask a question or you may make a mistake which may be innocent and this person may get upset, but you have to bear with them. You have to be able to say, you know what? I don't understand and I apologize and I understand your frustration because a lot of times when people are corrected, they get upset or they get angry and you know they get defensive and they want to fight back, but you have to understand that you know this is an everyday thing for for a lot of people to have to defend themselves or stick up for themselves or have their identity or or the validity of what they're doing questioned on a daily basis. And so you have to be able to understand and humble yourself and say, you know what, I get why this person is upset, and for them to snap at me or correct me. It's cool. I have to be able to understand that as an ally, as a friend, as a human being, and you know we can work this, work through this together. Does that make sense? Is there any other questions? I feel like there should be more than one question. I'm yeah, we sure got we got five minutes, so we can sit quietly. You guys or we probably ask know questions. everything about everything, right? So I'm just kidding. I think I know less now in my fifth year than I do in my first year. Yeah, probably. <laughs> no question. We will sit and stare at you for yeah. the next five minutes. Serious. Done it before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not a question, but it's um, it's like when uh, people who are not like of color or not like of like a minority or whatever, they think that like someone who's offended by something they said, they're like, oh, they're 
they're just overreacting because they always assume that. And it's like, well, it's, that's not the case because that really does offend someone and it really does get on their nerves that like, they make this racist or this stimulated um, comment or something like that. You know? Yeah, I think that's important to recognize. And, it, it, and again, it goes back to those microaggressions. The person saying something, whether it's a joke or a comment, could their intention could be completely innocent, but it could be the 80th time this person uh, uh, heard a joke or heard a comment or whatever, um, and they have to be able to understand that that's somebody's reality. And you may think it's a joke, but to another person, it may not be. You know, that's a reality you have to face. So it may be funny to you, but this person, you know, lives that reality every day. Thank you for the comments. And I think the difference in reaction is even if someone does like flip out or whatever, you know, like he's kind of like, oh, that's not cool. Like being able to just, instead of being like, it was a joke, just being like, you know what, I'm sorry. Like that is the difference between like stepping back and being like, you know what, there is something I don't know. And then being like, whatever, I'm going to say it anyway and I don't care how you feel. Because that's what it sounds like to the other person a lot of the time. Like, yeah, I said that and I know it offended you, but I don't really care. And I don't think anyone wants to have that said to them that what they're like, wow, that hurt, and the other person's like, screw you, sorry. Can I say that? I'm saying it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. So here's something, um, and let's wait on the, the shuffle to pack stuff up. we still got a few minutes. Um, so one of the frustrations I have as an instructor and as a coordinator of this program is we have 50 minute chunks to do all this stuff. Um, and then when I talk for 20 minutes or 25 minutes, then that limits you know, their opportunity to talk even more. Um, and so it's, if I were teaching all of your sec individual sections, what we'd be doing on Wednesday is diving further into this stuff. Um, but I don't know what you're going to get when you leave this room. I don't know what's going to happen in your Wednesday section. I don't know if you're going to talk about this in your Beatles to Beethoven class, whatever it is. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of constrictions around actually doing meaningful work on this. But what I'd like to hear from the two of you, if you can give like one piece of advice, if these folks all want to leave, and well, it's a blue screen now, but you all want to try to expand your paradigm and expand your consciousness in an active way about the way that the world works, what's kind of one piece of advice of how they can do that on this campus? In a, in a meaningful and in a respectful sort of way. Does that make sense? Okay, so like one piece of advice, so if you're taking nothing away from this other than what they're gonna tell you, take these pearls of wisdom. Oh, it's tough to give one piece of advice. I guess my, my, my advice is in parts. One, be honest and open. Two, I mean, speak your mind, but respectfully. Uh, three, question everything, okay? Seriously, question everything. The bathrooms you use, um, you know, what is the makeup of people around you, um, you know, What's this test like, or what, how is this class structured? All that sort of stuff. And then once you've done all that, be able to challenge it in one way or another. Ask questions, give comments, suggestions, that sort of thing. That's my advice. I'm gonna go to two parts too, just because I talk a lot. Um, one, go to go to a group. Go to an extracurricular, what is it, the? Student organization or something? What? It's like a student organization? Yeah, go to a student organization. Whether you go to their meetings, whether you go to their meeting space, whether you go, wherever they congregate, and just be in that space. You don't necessarily have to say anything, you don't necessarily have to do anything, but just listen. Um, you will probably, the first time, feel extremely uncomfortable, um, and that's okay. That's totally cool, just exist, and, and kind of take that in, and that will help you learn a lot about yourself and other people. And then, uh, two, Google it. If you think it's going to be something that's offensive to someone else, Google it, you're not offending anybody. Um, and that's my, that's always my big piece of advice. You might want to go up and ask someone a really uncomfortable question, if you don't know if it's uncomfortable, try Googling it. You might not get the right answer, but you might have more knowledge than you did before. So uh, ask questions. Awesome. All right. Thank you, folks.